Thank you, Dean Rutherford, and thank all of you for being here. It is such a thrill to be here, um, and I am excited to uh, to dive in. So I'm going to do that. And I, you know, the first thing I want to do actually is just open by, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read um, a few pages from the book, um, just to sort of set up the story a little bit and to give you a sense of how how I approach the story. Um, and then I will, uh, after, I, after I read for a few minutes, um, I'll, I'll just sort of lead you through um, some, of the, some of the points of the book and, and some of the sort of murky um, kind of gray areas of the book. This is a book about a, a guy, patient HM, who is a staple of, of every psychology textbook these days. Um, but I think the textbook story of, of patient HM is really only half the story um, at best and and uh, and the real story is 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 both you know I think more interesting and uh, also more troubling okay I'm gonna begin the laboratory at night the lights down low and IMAX streams a Pat Metheny version of an Ennio Morricone tune while Dr. Jacopo Anese, sitting in front of his ventilated biosafety cabinet, a small paintbrush in his hand, teases apart a crumpled slice of brain. The slice floats in saline solution in a shallow black plastic tray, looking exactly like a piece of ginger at a good sushi restaurant, one where they don't dye the ginger but leave it pale. Anese takes his brush and, with practiced dabs and tugs, gently unfurls it. The slice becomes a silhouette, recognizable for what it is, what organ it comes from, even if you are not, as Anese is, a neuroanatomist. He loves quiet nights like these, when his lab assistants set him up with everything he needs, the numbered specimen containers, the paint brushes, the empty glass slides, and then leave him alone with his music and his work. Anese coaxes the slice into position on the slide that lies half submerged in the tray, cocking his head, peering at it from different angles, checking to see that he has the orientation right. When you're looking directly at the slide, the left hemisphere must be on the right side of your field of view, just as it would be if you were staring into the eyes of the brain's owner. Although brains are roughly symmetrical, they are not entirely so, and Anese has become familiar with the topography of this one, all its subtly asymmetrical sulci. At the very center of this slice, in an area that would normally contain a buttressing framework of neural tissue, there are instead two gaping holes, one in each hemisphere. Anese takes extra care not to tear the edges of the holes or distort them, dabbing painstakingly at their frayed perimeters with the tip of his brush. The holes are historic, precious in their own way. Anese does not want to become famous as the second doctor to desecrate this particular brain. A few more prods and Anese begins to pull the glass out of the tray. Before he trained as a scientist, he worked as a cook, and he often uses cooking analogies to explain his techniques. The art of histology is a lot like baking, he says, since in both, everything must be finely calibrated with little room for improvisation. Soon the slide, with its burden perfectly positioned, is resting safely on the tepid surface of a warmer, which will be where it will be left to dry overnight. Anese reaches for another cryogenic vial, number 451, screws off the lid. Just before he tips the next slice into the tray, he turns to me and smiles. See how much work I have to do to clean up the mess your grandfather made, he says. There were things Henry loved to do. He loved to pet the animals. Bickford Healthcare Center was one of the first Eden alternative facilities in Connecticut, which meant that along with its 48 or so patients, the center housed three cats, four or five birds, a bunch of fish, a rabbit, and a dog named Sadie. Henry would spend hours sitting in his wheelchair in the courtyard with the rabbit on his lap and Sadie by his side. He loved to watch the trains go by. His room, 133, was on the far side of the center, and from his window, several times a day, he could watch the Amtrak rumble past the abandoned red brick husk of the old paper mill across the street. He loved word games. He'd sit for hours and hours and work through books full of them. Many of the scientific papers that have been written about Henry over the past six decades describe his avidity for crossword puzzles, though in his later years he found them too great a challenge and started doing simple find-a-word puzzles instead. He loved old movies. And Bogart and Bacall, that era, the African Queen, Gone with the Wind, North by Northwest, we call them classics, though of course they were not classics to him. He'd ask to see one of these movies, and a nurse or attendant would pop in a video cassette. 
television sets were no shock to him, TV being a technology that developed during his time, but he never did figure out how to operate a remote control. He loved talking to people. He'd tell them stories. He told the same stories over and over, but he always told them with equal enthusiasm. When people asked him if he remembered meeting them before, he'd often tell them that yes, he thought they'd once been friends. Hadn't they gone to high school together? Even when his uncertainty about these sorts of things frustrated him, he usually remained courteous and cheerful, compliant too. When the scientists would come to pick him up and take him to the laboratory, he never objected. And he almost always took his meds when the nurses asked him to. On the rare occasions that he refused, the nurses knew of an easy way to get him to cooperate. It was a trick passed down over decades, from one nurse to another. Henry, a nurse would say, Dr. Scoville insists that you take your meds right now. Invariably, he would comply. This strategy worked right up to the end until Henry died. The fact that Scoville had died decades before then, and that they'd had no contact for decades before that, made no difference. Scoville remained an authority figure in Henry's life because Henry's life never progressed beyond the day in 1953 when Dr. William Beecher Scoville, my grandfather, removed some small but important pieces of Henry's brain. I remember following my grandfather up a snowy hill during his last winter. I think he was wearing a light blue parka, and in my mind the parka is worn and threadbare, though that would have been uncharacteristic of him. This is a man who was once described by a New York Times reporter as, quote, almost unreal in his dashing appearance, end quote. But there it is in my memory, a threadbare blue parka. Maybe he even had a woolen cap, one with a pom-pom top pulled down over his pomaded hair. He always combed his hair with olive oil, that's what my mom says. We were going sledding. I remember snow, a white sky, some trees, cold, tramping up the hill together. He was dragging an old-fashioned wooden toboggan behind him, big enough for the two of us. When he reached the top of the hill, he stopped, looked back toward me, and waited. Why do I remember any of this? I remember because when the cascade of impressions from my eyes, ears, and skin bombarded me with sights and sounds and textures, with leafless trees and my grandfather's hat and the crunch of our boots in the fresh snow, those impressions were channeled to some small but important parts of my ten-year-old brain. Then my brain went to work, processing raw sensation into something else, a memory, one that still resides inside me three decades later, to be called up on occasion and dragged, blinking and uncertain, into the light. I'm getting ahead of myself. Memories make us. Everything we are is everything we were. This has always been true and is so obvious that it hardly needs to be said. But though memories make us, we've only recently begun to understand how we make memories. The story of how we've gained this understanding is the story I'm telling in this book. It's a story with heroes and villains, tragedy and romance, violence and tenderness. My grandfather plays a part, but it's much bigger than my grandfather. It's a story about science and about nature, human and otherwise. And it begins, like a lot of stories do, with a fall. So the fall that I'm referring to there, it happened in 19... 34, 33 or 34, actually, scientists sort of debate the, the precise year. And that was a year when a young boy named Henry Mollison was walking home from a park in Hartford, Connecticut uh, at night. He wasn't wearing his glasses. He had pretty poor eyesight. And he got knocked down by a bicyclist. Henry was yeah, around eight years old at the time. Um, got knocked down by a bicyclist, went flying, hit his head, uh, was knocked unconscious. Um, uh, he stayed unconscious for about five minutes. Uh, then he came to, and he seemed to be all right. Um, but it soon became clear that he wasn't entirely all right. Uh, soon after that accident, Henry began having seizures. Um, the seizures increased in frequency and severity uh, over the years until by the time he was uh, about 15 or 16, he began having major seizures, often daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, it was a sort of devastating illness to every part of his life, from his social life to his academic life. Um, uh, to his professional life. Uh, he was 
unable to really engage with the world in in in, in the way you might like uh, in the way he, he in ways he would have liked to. Um, I mean, one of the more poignant examples of how it affected him always to me was you know he he struggled for years to make it through high school, which was very difficult for him because of the the these seizures. Uh, and when he finally did get his high school diploma at the age of 22, um, the principal of his high school wouldn't allow him to go across the stage to collect the diploma because he was afraid that Henry might have a seizure while he was on the stage, which would have embarrassed the whole, um, the whole assembly. Um, uh, he and his parents, he was an only child, um, only child of uh, you know, parents who, who, who struggled. They, his father was uh, an electrician, often out of work. Uh, his mother was a housekeeper. They didn't have much money. They moved around a lot. Um, uh, they, uh, they, they, they weren't very, they became sort of increasingly isolated as his uh, illness progressed, um, and they became increasingly desperate um, for a, uh, a cure. Um, that's one sort of, that's when I think of sort of where, where the story of ha patient HM begins, that's, that's sort of one of the places it begins. Uh, Another place it begins is it, you can sort of stretch all the way back into sort of uh, ancient Greek mythology. Um, and it begins in sort of our first attempts to, to understand how memory works. Um, and it begins, you could say, sort of with the, the myth of uh, Nemocene, who was the, the mother of the muses, uh, who um, was considered by, uh, by, by Homer to be maybe the most important of all, all the gods, because without her, uh, no stories would be possible. She was the mother of, of memory. Um, uh, uh, she was sort of our first, human's first attempt to, to explain memory and how memory works. Um, in these sort of mythical, mystical terms. Eventually we began trying to explain memory in, in more sort of scientific ways or quasi-scientific ways. In 369 BC, Socrates has this fascinating description of how he believed memory to work and he described sort of a, a, a ball of wax that was in all our souls that would be kind of embossed with, um, with the, the most important events of our lives which would then sometimes wash away depending on how impactful those events were. And strangely, when you look at sort of the long sort of sweep of, 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 of progress and, 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 and the, 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 the progression of human knowledge, um, our understanding of so many things progressed sort of by leaps and bounds over the last couple of millennia. Memory didn't progress all that far beyond sort of Socrates' explanation until the 1950s. It was still very much a mystery, um, the, the sort of just the basic mechanics of memory. Um, uh, lots of other things about how the brain worked um, were kind of coming to light. There were famous cases that a lot of you have probably heard of, like the case of Phineas Gage, who was a, a railroad worker in Vermont who had a tamping iron sort of blown through a portion of his skull, um, which obliterated a portion of his frontal lobes. And uh, sort of, some people say that the case has been exaggerated somewhat, but the, the again, the sort of the textbook version of his case is that after this event, which he survived, he became kind of, he went from being this mild-mannered guy into this kind of rabble-rouser, um, a very difficult, ornery guy. And so people uh, decided, well, the front lo frontal lobes must have something to do with kind of reining in our, our behavior. Um, and then bit by bit, sort of all these, I, I say in the book, the broken illuminated the unbroken. Uh, bit by bit, people who had various problems with their brains began to clue us in to how the brain works and how different parts of the brain work. So somebody with a, with a, a lesion to a particular part of their brain who couldn't articulate words, who could only say tan, tan, tan over and over, um, clued us into that part of the brain being crucial for speech articulation. Somebody else might have damage to a part of the brain that keeps them from being able to hear anything, and so we know that that's sort of the auditory cortex or the visual cortex. Basically, um, all these different aspects of the brain came to light uh, on the backs of these, on the backs of the study of, of a variety of injured people. But memory is, in some senses, almost the, the, our most important function. Um, but it was, it was, a, it was really a, a mystery. Um, 1953, 
um, the, the sort of prevailing wisdom about how memory worked, works was that it wasn't dependent on any particular part of the brain. Uh, people thought that if you, it would, it, if, if you cut out like 10% of the brain, you would cut out 10% of your memories, regardless of what part of the brain you, you took out. Um, there, there wasn't any sense that there were really specific and discrete structures in the brain that would, that would help you remember. Then along came Henry. And the, the, um, the, the other sort of, there's, there's Henry's fall. The other sort of uh, major fall in the book is uh, my grandmother's. Uh, so, and, and this sort of led directly actually to, to, uh, to, to, Henry, to Henry becoming patient HM. So my grandmother in 1944, um, Emily Scoville was her name. Uh, she she um, she had a breakdown. Uh, she began hearing voices. Uh, she um, became increasingly paranoid, increasingly delusional. Uh, she ultimately believed that her um, five-year-old son, my uncle, was commanding her to kill herself, and she uh, she attempted suicide. Um, uh, she had three young children at the time, my, my mother and my two uncles. Um, uh, after her breakdown, she did not, she did not succeed, uh, thank goodness, in, in killing herself, but she, after her attempt, she was institutionalized. Um, and she was institutionalized in, a, uh, in an asylum in um, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, known as the Institute of Living. Uh, the Institute of Living, is it has it's one of those very evocative um, names. I, uh, I'm fascinated by just the name alone. But the Institute of Living is one of the oldest asylums in the United States. It's a very um, and it was uh, it, it catered at the time in the mid '40s to very sort of wealthy clients. Beautiful place, uh, like a lot of these old asylums were. The grounds were designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, the same guy who designed Central Park. It had uh, an indoor bowling alley. It had an outdoor swimming pool. It had, you know, a whole sort of outdoor shopping mall of various sort of boutique shops that the that the uh, you know the, the patients could go to. Um, underneath, though, this very sort of civilized and kind of genteel veneer, uh, it had a lot of very dark things going on. Um, it was run by a guy named Charles Burlingham who was uh, the, the superintendent of the asylum at the time. And he was an, a, a believer in all the most sort of like, uh, all, he, he was a believer in the so-called physical therapies for mental illness. He believed that um, mental illness uh, could be rooted out um, through a variety of procedures, um, some of which seem kind of horrifying to us today, uh, some of which I didn't even know existed until I began uh, looking into my grandmother's case and discovered that she had um, sort of endured these. Um, a lot of them you've heard of, like electroshock therapy. There were others, for example, pyreta therapy, uh, otherwise known as fever therapy, where they would put her in a box, basically, and heat her up until she, they induced a fever of 106 degrees, and they would keep her in that state for eight hours um, a day for a period of a week um, at, a, at, at a time. Um, there were a number of these types of therapies that were um, sort of in vogue at the time. Also, at the time, the, this, this was sort of the, the dawn of the era of the lobotomy, um, which is the most sort of direct physical therapy for, um, for mental illness. Um, my grandfather, her husband, uh, was a neurosurgeon. Um, he, uh, after her breakdown, uh, he, before her breakdown, he was sort of an all-purpose neurosurgeon. He specialized in, he didn't really have a, a, a specialty. I mean, he would, he would operate on, uh, you know, all sorts of spinal injuries. He would operate on tumors. After her, um, after her breakdown, he became obsessed isn't really too strong a word with discovering uh, and, and helping to discover a surgical treatment for mental illness. Uh, he uh, ultimately became the second most prolific lobotomist in history. Um, uh, and he was motivated in his pursuit of sort of the, 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 the perfect lobotomy uh, by his wife's um, uh, illness. He, he, he hoped to one day discover a way to cure her. Um, 
he was not alone in this. This was the lobotomy now, when we look back at it, uh, can seem like this um, just sort of dark episode of quackery um, in, you know, a long time ago. Um, but it wasn't. It wasn't the, the people who were... Uh, uh, who were the, at, the, at, the, at the, the, the sort of leaders of the lobotomy movement, um, many of them were people like my grandfather, who was really sort of a revered neurosurgeon. He was the, head of the, depart the, he the founder and head of the Department of Neurosurgery at Hartford Hospital. He taught at Yale. Um, he, uh, he, 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 he was uh, the head of the International Association of, of Neurosurgery. Um, uh, and, and he, like a lot of neurosurgeons of the day, um, you know, bought into the lobotomy um, as, uh, you know, as a very promising approach. Um, and he, more than most neurosurgeons of the day, was willing to sort of pursue his interest in the lobotomy down some very again, in retrospect, at least some very dark roads. He was given what one psychiatrist described as, one psychiatrist who was a superintendent of an asylum, uh, he was given unlimited access to the psychiatric material of a number of asylums, uh, which meant that he was able to go in and um, in some cases fairly arbitrarily uh, uh, choose um, what parts of the brain to take out of various inmates and sort of see what kind of effect that would have. Um, it, it was uh, um, it was both it was this it, he he occupied this strange gray zone between medical research and medical practice. Um, he genuinely hoped to, uh, to to help his patients, I believe, um, but he also was genuinely fascinated by what um, uh, you know what the structures of, of, of various parts of the brain that he was removing actually did. Now, how does this all play into the story of Henry? So Henry and my grandfather, so there's two falls and then there's a collision between, my Hen between Henry and my grandfather. Henry uh, came to my grandfather's office in Hartford, Connecticut uh, um, in the, probably for the first time, the, the records are a little hazy on this, but probably for the first time uh, in, in the late 1940s. Um, Henry is desperate. Um, he, you know, he, he has this severe epilepsy, it's intractable, nothing seems to help, he's on anti-epileptic meds. Uh, my grandfather at first uh, sort of keeps him, keeps him on uh, various doses of anti-epileptic medications, um, doesn't suggest any sort of surgical intervention at first. By, by the time he's been seeing Henry for several years, 1953, um, there is an increasing interest in the medical community as a whole uh, and also in the sort of the so-called psychosurgical community, the, the, lobo the lobotomist community, um, in these particular structures in the brain uh, known as the medial temporal lobes, um, which are deep in the brain um, and they include the hippocampus, the amygdala, the uncus, the entorhinal cortex, but there's a particular fascination with this, this, this sort of seahorse-shaped structure known as the hippocampus. Nobody knows what it does for sure. They know it's right at the center of the brain. A lot of people from, you know, neurophysiologists to neuroanatomists to neurosurgeons are fascinated by it. They think it's very important. They just don't know what it does. Um, my grandfather begins performing so-called medial temporal lobotomies on a variety of patients in, um, in, in asylums. Um, it doesn't seem to have much of an effect on their mental illness. Um, and these patients are so disturbed to begin with that it's very hard to figure out sort of what effect it had at all on them. Um, Henry comes then, his, his sort of, uh, you know, a desperation is increasing. Uh, my grandfather offers him an experimental operation. Uh, he tells Henry that, that uh, you know, that he thinks that a medial temporal lobotomy might help alleviate his epilepsy. Um, he has some evidence on his side for believing this. There are some forms of epilepsy that do originate in the, in the medial temporal lobes, and some surgeons even at the time would go and unilaterally remove one hemisphere of the medial temporal lobes, and they would have some success in treating epilepsy at the time. Uh, there was no evidence that Henry suffered from that type of epilepsy, that he suffered from, from, from temporal epilepsy. Nonetheless, Henry was desperate. 
Henry consented. Um, my grandfather operated. He drilled two silver dollar sized holes in his forehead. He levered up his frontal lobes using something called a flat brain spatula and he used something called a suction catheter to, um, to basically suction out um, uh, Henry's hippocampus bilaterally, meaning from both from both uh, hemisphere and his amygdala and his uncus and his entorhinal cortex. Um, it did not cure Henry's epilepsy. What it did and what became evident instantly uh, was it obliterated Henry's ability to create new memories. From that moment forward, for the rest of his life, for more than five decades, Henry lived his life in 30 second increments. Uh, the present would just sort of slide off of him uh, and um, which, as you can imagine, this was, he already was leading a very difficult life. Um, this, though, was a, an almost impossible to fathom tragedy from Henry's perspective. Um, you know, his life in a lot of ways stopped right there on the, on the operating table. As tragic as it was for Henry, that's how revelatory it was for the scientific community. Um, for the first time, uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, this, this ancient mystery of how does memory work, where, what is the seat of memory, it seemed like it, seemed like it had been answered. Uh, we knew all of a sudden that these particular structures, and probably most specifically the hippocampus, were required to create new long-term memories. Um, that became clear as soon as Henry left the, you know, left the operating table. Um, you know, he, he, he would meet somebody and have a conversation and then they'd walk out of the room and they'd come back in and he'd meet them all over, all over again. Um, it was, um, he, he, he experienced what's known sort of in the, you know, in the, in the, in the parlance as anterograde amnesia, meaning going forward. So he, he uh, from the moment he had that operation for the rest of his life, he could not create new so-called episodic memories. He did have intact in some form his memories from before the operation, which made him, you know, his personality was okay, you know, was more or less intact, his um, somewhat, um, uh, his language skills were there. You could have a conversation with him, and if you didn't leave the room or you didn't talk to him for too long, you might not notice anything was wrong with him. He was still smart, um, but he was, you know, he experienced the world from that moment forward in, in a very different way than, 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 than we all do. Um, he became, over the years, uh, the most intensely scrutinized human research subject of all time. Um, uh, he became sort of the the foundation or he, he became he was sort of the seminal patient in the history of memory science and he you know hundreds of, of, of research papers were written about him uh, and hundreds of scientists uh, worked with him and some scientists literally sort of built their backs uh, built their careers on the backs of their kind of privileged access to Henry um, the the um, the, the first person really who, who uh, the, first, the first kind of revelations to come out of, of Henry's case uh, were, were sort of, were, were, were made by or discovered by a scientist at McGill University or the Montreal Neurological Institute in, in Montreal, a woman named Brenda Milner. Who is, uh, who is still uh, an active researcher and professor. Um, I think she's 95 years old right now. Um, she's a remarkable woman. And uh, uh, she was the first person to really scrutinize Henry from kind of a, you know, neuropsychological perspective. Uh, and the first paper that she wrote about him, uh, she, she co-wrote it with my grandfather. My grandfather was actually the lead author on the paper, although he didn't really do any of the work, but it was 1957. And, and um, uh, all, all he really did was describe the, the surgical procedure. She, she, she wrote the meat of the paper. Um, but she, uh, she, she, she laid out in persuasive and still persuasive, you know, uh, terms how how because Henry's deficits were so extreme and because they knew exactly what had been taken from his brain these particular structures must be required for for long term for the creation of new episodic memories um, she also discovered not long afterwards sort of the second major revelation that came out of Henry's case which was that 
yes, there is this one memory system in the brain, the sort of the main one we think about when we think about how memory works, um, that is reliant on these particular structures. But there are, there's also a separate um, and distinct memory system in the brain that is not reliant on these structures, known as the procedural memory system. And what she, um, how she discovered this was she gave Henry a test. Uh, it's a common test, and some of you may have done it before. Um, uh, it's, it's called the mirror tracing task. And you're given a piece of paper with a star on it, with little narrow borders of the star, and uh, then you're, you're, the, the paper is covered so you can't see your hand holding a pencil um, directly. All you can see is a, mi a, a mirror is put in front of you. So you can see the paper and your hand in the mirror, and then you try to trace around the star. It sounds easy, it's really hard. It feels like you, you become almost paralyzed because your hand is not moving in the direction you think it's going to move when you're looking in the mirror. Um, it's something that you get better at over time. Um, after a few, maybe after 15 goes, um, you become pretty adept at, at sort of compensating uh, for this strange strangeness of looking in the mirror. Uh, what, what Brenda Milner discovered was that Henry got good at that just as quickly as normal people with intact brains. Um, uh, even though he could never remember having done this task before, every time he finished it, it was like he was doing it for the first time, a part of his brain clearly did remember because he was able to do it just as quickly as anybody else, which again meant that, these, th that that type of memory, which is the memory we use to do all sorts of things, from riding a bike to you know, swinging a tennis racket, et cetera, that type of memory is not reliant on the hippocampus or the medial temporal lobe structures at all. Over the years after, and that came out in, I think, 1962, he remained a research subject um, until his death in 2008, and even afterwards. The, the, the things that were discovered about him weren't necessarily as interesting afterwards. Um, those were the main two things, uh, but he did remain this, uh, you know, this actively scrutinized human being. He would spend as, as much as like a month at a time living at the, uh, at, at, in a laboratory at, at MIT, uh, which is where ultimately a lot of the, the research was, was done on him in his later years. Um, and they would conduct, you know, experiments on everything from his pain threshold to uh, his, um, you know, whether or not he would eat multiple meals. If you, if you gave him a meal and then took it away and gave him another meal, would he keep on going? And yes, he would. Um, uh, one of the things I discovered, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of skirting over some of, the, some of the ethically murky areas here, but one of the things I, I discovered was that for a great period of time that he was being studied at MIT, for a period of a dozen years at least, uh, Henry was the only person signing his informed consent forms um, when he was uh, you know, being experimented on. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to make the argument on a number of levels that Henry could, was actually in a position to consent on his own behalf. I mean, he, by the time he, consent forms are fairly long, by the time he would get to the end, he would have forgotten the beginning. Um, also, he had, he had uh, um, I, I had mentioned the hippocampus was taken, but also probably just as importantly when it came to the issue of consent, his amygdala was removed. The amygdala is sort of the emotional center of the brain, and people who have no amygdalas tend to be very passive individuals. Um, and they they are neurologically predisposed to consent to just about anything. Uh, so you combine his profound amnesia with a, you know, uh, a brain that's, that's ready-made to consent, and I think, I think it's hard to argue that, that MIT was in the right in having him consent on his own behalf. They ultimately, I believe, realized that. They brought in a conservator to sign on his own behalf. That conservator uh, gained his conservatorship on the basis of claiming that he was Henry's closest living relative, it turned out that that was not the case. When I looked into it, Henry had, um, uh, had uh, relatives much more closely related than his conservator who were not aware of what was being done to Henry. Um, uh, it, the, the sort of, the, the ethical issues continued actually after Henry's death. When Henry died, he was, um, uh, his brain was removed and then ultimately became a, the, the, the object of a, of a very um, heated custody battle between two big universities fighting over the, um, the ownership of Henry's brain. Um, I, 
I came to this story, you know, this is a story that, that was, it, it was part of my um, sort of family lore. And then as, as I got older, I, I realized that it was um, uh, kind of a part of, 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 of common lore as well. Um, so it was a story I was always drawn to. Oddly, it was a story that, that, I, that was sort of inaccessible to me until Henry died. I had actually, I tried to find Henry and reach Henry um, before his death, um, but I, I had the doors sort of constantly closed in, in, in my face. Um, Henry, prior to his death, his, his, his name was uh, like a closely guarded secret. Um, the scientists who studied him always referred to him just as patient HM and tried to keep his autobiographical details out of any papers that were written about him in order to prevent people like me from finding him. Um, and, uh, and they succeeded at doing so. Although I did, I, I will say, I did find his name before he, was, um, before he passed away, but I never, I never met Henry. Um, uh, after he died, in a, again, in a sort of paradoxically, he became a much more accessible individual. All of a sudden, you know, the next day, the New York Times had a front page obituary where they revealed his name uh, for the first time. And then I, I, not long after that, began looking into his story. Um, it was a it, it was uh, it was a long process. It was also one that that uh, took me to some unexpected places that I'm still sort of grappling with, I think, on, on a certain level when it comes to sort of my grandmother's story and what she endured. She, she in some ways, to me, was the, 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 at the heart of this story. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to, just before I open it up for questions, I was just going to read um, one of the more kind of shocking moments for me was at the very end, I... Um, I met with the principal researcher in Henry's case, a woman named Dr. Suzanne Corkin. Um, she sort of inherited Henry from Brenda Milner, um, and she's a, she was a neuroscience professor at MIT. Sadly, she passed away as the book was in final proofs. Um, but during this, this, this final interview that I had with, with Corkin, she told me something that, that shocked me. Um, so, and this is a transcript verbatim of, of my conversation with her. Are you aiming to give his files to an archive? Corkin, not his files, but I'm giving his memorabilia to my department, and they'll be on display on the third floor. Right, and what's going to happen to the files themselves? She paused for several seconds. Corkin, shredded. Me, shredded? Why would they be shredded? Corkin, nobody's going to look at them. Me, really? I can't imagine shredding the files of the most important research subject in history. Why would you do that? Corkin, well, you can't just take one test on one day and draw conclusions about it. That's a very dangerous thing to do. M me, yeah, but your files would be comprehensive. They'd spend decades. Corkin, yeah, well, the tests are gone, the test data, the data sheets are gone because the stuff is published. Most of it is published, or a lot of it is published. Me, but not all of it. Corkin, well, the things that aren't published are, you know, experiments that just didn't go right. Didn't, you know, there was a problem. He had a seizure or something like that. And I'm actually going to just race through this because I want to make sure that... I, I, I'll, so I'll just paraphrase. Basically, she, she told me that she, she, she had shredded a lot of his data, that uh, most of it that remained she was planning to shred, uh, though the timetable was, was unclear. And uh, she gave a number of explanations for why that was okay. Um, this, to me, was this sort of almost... It was almost like a, when I heard it, it, it struck me as almost kind of this mirror to, to the initial um, tragedy in Henry's case, the, in the operation itself, which, which was this removal of these parts of his brain. And now, after all of this science had been built up on, 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 uh, on his back or on the back of his brain, um, a lot of the data itself, the seminal data itself, was going to be shredded, which struck me as, as wrong. Um, it, that became, though, that section became a source of a lot of uh, controversy, as did uh, other, other elements of the book. Um, uh, but I wanted to make sure, again, I just wanted to make sure that we have time for enough questions. So, um, and, and I'll just say one other thing, sort of when I think about the book, and when I think about sort of some of the, some of the things that, that Henry taught us, another thing that Henry taught us about memory and how memory works, or, or that was sort of built on, 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 on the research that was done on Henry, is that memories always change. Um, even, even the 
those of us who are lucky enough to have intact brains, whenever we remember uh, 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 an event from the past, whenever we sort of call it up, um, we're changing certain details of it in the remembering. Uh, we might, you know, sand some details off or, you know, make some details a little sharper than they actually were. People who were present may drop in and out of view. And the next time we remember that memory, we tend to be remembering not the original event itself, but our last memory of it. Um, uh, and, and I think that there's, there's, there's something poignant again about the sort of shifting nature of memory. And I think stories also change. And I think that that's one of the things that I learned working on this story, is that the story of Henry as it's been told forever um, or f since 1953, um, is, due, is due to change as well. And, and, and uh, anyway, so, so yeah, I'd love to open it up for questions. Thanks, Luke. Thank yeah, you. No. All right. Great job. <laughs> Heck of a story. All right, we have a question right here. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, first, thank, thank you. This is fascinating. Thank you. Um, did you find with cognitive memory that there was emotional memory? connected in some way? Well, in, in Henry's case, I mean, Henry, since he didn't have, since, since his amygdala was removed as well, his, his sort of, his emotional engagement with the world was, was, was very different too. He was very um, sort of flat in affect. Um, but yes, for sure, I mean, our, our emotions are wrapped up in, in, uh, in our memories in really profound ways. And, and the, 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 the events of our lives that are most emotionally moving to us tend to be the events of our lives that we remember forever. Okay, we had a question right there. Yes. yes. Well, <clears throat> actually, I have a comment and a question both. My comment is just to, to remind people that the state of medical ethics is very different now than it was 70 years ago. There were things that, other kinds of things that happened back then that we would be equally horrified about today. For sure. And I think we need to remember the, that the state of medical care is just very different than it was then. My question is, was he, in his adulthood, uh, institutionalized, and if he was, why? Because if he had family who could have helped take care of him, couldn't he have been cared for at home? He, he was cared for at home uh, by his parents um, until after they both passed away. Then he lived with a, a, a sort of caretaker for a few years, and then he spent the last 25 or so years of his life in, in a nursing home. Um, yeah. Not a state asylum. No. 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 Question right here. You said that your grandfather had done a great number of these lobotomies. Were there ever, was this one that he did on Henry unique, or why did not any of the others that he had done have the memory problem? Yeah, so um, it, it was not unique. Um, he had performed the identical operation on some other people in asylums, um, but they were, and they, it turned out, so Brenda Milner, who was the Montreal-based um, neuropsychologist who first sort of studied Henry, after she studied Henry, and this is back in the 50s, the first thing she did was ask my grandfather, well, did you perform any of these operations on anyone else? And he said, yes, I did it on so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. And then he, she went to visit all of these people and test them. One of the sad saddest things I learned, I think, during the, the reporting this book was that it wasn't until Brenda Milner went, years later in some cases, to visit these people after, you know, years after their operations, um, that anybody realized that these people were just as profoundly amnesic as Henry. But they were just these sort of backwards cases in these asylums that nobody really paid much attention to. And so they were, they had just the same degree of amnesia in most cases as, as Henry did, but their mental illness sort of fogged everything up to such a degree that nobody could really tell. And one of the, you know, a, a, another thing that you'll find in all the textbooks is that, you know, this operation was performed on Henry, lesson learned, we never performed an operation like that again. Another sort of tragic twist is that my grandfather actually performed an identical operation the following year on another asylum resident. Um, Any other questions? Okay, I've got one that we talked about, oh, sure. yeah. uh, and that was um, the lobotomy of 
Rosemary Kennedy, uh, which at the time the Kennedys could have afforded the best medical care, the best treatment, whatever. So would you talk about the relationship between yeah. how that and, and, and your grandfather? Sure, sure. Well, the, the lobotomy of Rosemary Kennedy um, was carried out by a, a guy named Walter Freeman. Uh, Walter Freeman was, if my grandfather was the second most prolific lobotomist, Walter Freeman was the first. Um, uh, he had a very different approach to the lobotomy. He ultimately developed a, 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 the so-called transorbital lobotomy, which sounds fancy but was really brutal. It was uh, sort of a modified ice pick that would go in behind your orbital bones. Uh, and just sort of, you, he would swish them around in there and very coarsely and imprecisely uh, kind of, uh, you know, mess up your, your frontal lobes. Um, this, uh, my grandfather and Walter Freeman, uh, Rosemary Kennedy's lobotomist, were actually um, sort of competitors in a lot of ways. There's a, there's a chapter in my book devoted to this event that I found where there was sort of a surgical showdown that they had one afternoon in, a, in an asylum, um, actually at the Institute of Living, my grandmother's asylum, where they brought in one after another four different women and in front of an illustrious group of neurosurgeons, uh, lobotomized them in their own different ways over the course of that afternoon, sort of showing off their, their latest techniques. Um, that and I say they, they, it was before an audience of very sort of illustrious people in the medical community, I think that's an important thing to remember also when we think about these times is that these were uh, these were people not just at the vanguard of the psychosurgical movement, but at the vanguard of sort of neurosurgery in general. Uh, the New York Times was writing sort of laudatory reviews of the lobotomy, talking about how, you know, surgery for the soul sick could pluck out mental illness as easily as a diseased tooth. Um, there were all sorts of gushing headlines about how effective it was. Um, anyway, it was, and I, I think, you know, it, it just reminds us how, um, how we can get swept up in, uh, in, in medical crazes sometimes um, without realizing how, you know, the damage we may be doing. Yeah. Yes. You can, yeah. sure. So your, your grandfather, did he um, support lobotomies in the surgery through his whole career or did he come to see it differently at some point? He, he, he continued to lobotomize people at least into the 1970s. He died in 1983. He was one of the um, people who continued to do it for longer than, than sort of almost anybody else. And he also, I mean, in terms of his support of things, I mean, you, you had asked about whether he did the same operation to other people, and I brought up this person that he operated on after Henry. Um, one thing that people often ask me is whether he ever expressed guilt. Um, he didn't express guilt about Henry, and he didn't express guilt about most of the people that he operated, uh, that he performed lobotomies on, but Brenda Milner told me that um, when she told him about this particular patient that he'd operated on the year after Henry, when she told him after she went to study this guy that this guy had been a medical doctor, um, this asylum patient, that that really shook him and that she'd never seen him so shook. Um, so there was something about the idea that he had operated on a guy who was in some senses a peer of his, um, which was not the case in most of the operations he performed that really shook him. Well, let's, uh, let's okay, oh. okay, we got time yeah. for one more question. Yeah. yeah. You, mentioned, you mentioned enterograde amnesia. Yes. Um, and then you briefly touched on his memory prior to the event. Yeah. Was his retrograde, was there any retrograde amnesia? What, so there what was, awareness did he have? So there was a retrograde amnesia for a period, for like an indistinct period of years prior to the operation. There was some clear retrograde amnesia. Also, one th for a long time, sort of the basic understanding of his case was that other than that, his, his preoperative memory was more or less intact. M most people now think actually that that's not really the case. That even his memories from prior to the operation were not the types of memories that we have when we call up events from our childhood or from last week. They weren't as fully fleshed. They were, as the word that the neuroscientist uses, they were semanticized. Basically, the events, the episodes of his life were distilled down into just sort of dry constellation of facts. So he couldn't really, he couldn't really tell stories in any sense. That's another thing that was sort of robbed of him. Um, he, the only stories he could tell were very rote, uh, 
repetitive ones. It didn't, he didn't really remember things, even prior to the operation, uh, in ways that we do. Although he had access to those facts, just not the stories that those facts supported. Well, listen, th this is fascinating. And uh, let's thank Luke again for being here with thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. And I hope, uh, I hope you'll come visit with him and as he signs his book, Patient HM. Luke, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks again.